I'm going to talk, say a few things about uh, carbon and because it's uh, um, hit the headlines in the last few weeks and we'll see that at the end of this talk. That's just to wake you up. All right. Uh, um, we'll start off really with Big Bang Theory. Um, just in case you're very quick at going back to sleep again. Um, anyway, according to people who think they know something, uh, the Big Bang was, uh, well, took place in something like 10 to the minus 43 of a second. In 10 to the minus 32 of a second, the temperature was 10 to the 37K. I mean, that book with a million uh, decimal points is, you know, a, it's, it's probably a low, a high temperature, okay? After a millionth of a second, the temperature is about 10 to the 13K. After three minutes, it was about 10 to the 8K. After 300,000 years, 10,000 degrees, the first atoms were formed, hydrogen, helium, and the light metals. The first stars were formed in, after one billion years. Temperature is about 100K. And the second generation stars, our sun is a second generation star, uh, are around one billion to five billion years. And now uh, we're told that the universe is 13.75 plus or minus 0.17 billion years old and the temperature is about 2.73 Kelvin. So that's uh, all that physicists are interested in. The rest of us are probably interested in some other things. Let's have a survey of what the universe is. It has clusters of about, in this particular case, 2,000 galaxies in this image. All those spots are actually more or less all galaxies. And you, as you blow them up, you see they have structure. And they're spheroidal and elliptical galaxies and uh, the spiral galaxies. And my favorite spiral is this one in Canis Finitici. Uh, probably the most famous is the sombrero hat. And when you look at this, there's dust in the galactic plane. Okay, so that's dust, um, molecules, and, and planets and stars are all there. And that glow that you see around there, that's, those are stars. Um, obviously, you can't uh, resolve them in this image. And there are about 10 to the 11 galaxies in the universe, with about 10 to the 11 stars in each one, roughly. When you go a little bit deeper into a galaxy, one has emission nebulae, such as these Rosette nebulae, where the, this is basically hydrogen emitting to the, um, the alpha line and the, um, the Balmer series, and the Balmer series of hydrogen. And there are dark dust clouds. The black area that you see is a point where there's no, there are, basically you can't see the stars behind. Those are black clouds which are obscuring the light behind. As far as this particular lecture is concerned, what, some rather interesting objects are these, um, what are called planetary nebulae, they shouldn't really be called nebulae, but basically they're a star that's blown off the outer, outer sort of gas. And in fact, the diameter of this is about a light year, so something like 100,000 times the Earth's orbit, some number like that. So it's a fairly big object, the star's blown this off. You'll know, of course, about supernovae, and this is the famous uh, remnant, um, the Crab Nebula of a uh, sort of supernova that uh, something like a, a thousand years ago blew up. This is one of the most interesting images for our purposes. It's a red giant, and in fact, you see all that, those sort of, uh, sort of little waves outside. That is material being blown out of that star, and we're going to look be very interested in that. Well, I'm very interested. I don't know whether you're going to be interested, but I'm pretty interested in this. Um, this is a one from my uh, friend and colleague, Mike Jura, where we see a emission of gas and, and dust. You're looking at Rayleigh scattering here. You can't see the star. It's in behind that yellow sort of forward scattering. And the red um, sort of, uh, sort of arm-shaped object is is a plume of gas being blown out of this particular star. And there's a dark neighbor in the, onto the left-hand side. Of course, we're all familiar with that, the planets. Um, my favorite image of the sun is this one from a magazine. I've kept it for maybe 30 or 40 years. It's so long. It's a fantastic image. Um, another object that's interesting for us are comets. 
And how many of you have seen Halley's Comet? How many have you seen it? Not that many. It's a spectacular sight, and we're going to talk a little bit about that. Now, what about carbon? Well, it's, uh, we know there's a bit around, um, and it's produced in stars um, by a fusion process. Um, the main process in a star is basically um, hydrogen or protons being fused into helium. Um, and that powers the sun. So up between a million and 10 million degrees, you get this particular reaction in which protons, four protons are squeezed into helium. Now, it turned out it was rather a tricky problem to understand why there was any carbon here at all. People looked at themselves and said, yeah, we've got some carbon. But when they looked at the, um, the nuclear reactions, it turned out it was really not obvious why there should be any carbon at all. It was a problem. Um, but let's go on, let's assume there is carbon. And once you've got carbon, you can go on to the higher elements and whole, a whole sort of uh, fusion process occurring the sun uh, or in later um, old stars like red giants goes on to produce uh, all the elements up to iron. And after iron, they're unstable. And what happens then is that the higher elements than, uh, than uh, iron are produced in supernovae. So our, our picture now is that in the Big Bang, you've produced basically helium, hydrogen, and probably up to lithium. In stellar interiors, carbon to iron and in supernovae elements with mass greater than that in iron, such as uranium and the heavy, really heavy elements. Now, what about carbon? It turns out it's a rather strange sort of story. Um, people couldn't quite understand why it was there as they looked at the various nuclear reactions, and they decided that it was a very curious uh, triple coincidence. The first thing is that two helium nuclei in a bimolecular process um, produces beryllium-8, but it's not stable. It turns out beryllium-8 is metastable. Um, it has a lifetime of about 10 to the minus 17 of a second. So it's not there for very long, all right. But it's, a, it's about 10,000 times more stable than was expected in the simple collision of a bimolecular collision. The second thing is that Fred Hoyle, who um, some of you may have know, uh, a, a rather eminent um, astronomer, British astronomer, made a suggestion that what's possibly happening is that helium collides with the metastable beryllium and that there is a resonance with the energy of an excited state of carbon-12. And he predicted that it would be about 7.7 .7 eV. And nobody really believed that, but Fowler at um, Caltech, who had the equipment to measure this, looked at this and found that it was at 7.655. So Hoyle had predicted something that no one else had predicted before, was basically an excited state energy level. Um, and it was on the basis of what we would now call an anthropic concept. Um, not only that, it turns out that if the resonance between carbon-12 and helium into oxygen, if that were resonant or possible, there would be no carbon either. So this is triple coincidence. The first is that beryllium-8 is metastable. The second is that helium plus beryllium-8 has the same energy or mass plus the, the temperature of the star to be resonant into carbon-12, and that helium plus carbon-12 is not resonant, otherwise it would just all go on into oxygen and we wouldn't have enough carbon to make ourselves. Now that, you might think it would be bad news, but for some people I think it would be probably quite a good, good thing. Anyway, the triple alpha process is this unusual uh, triple coincidence, and that was interesting, and, Pat and Fowler got the Nobel Prize for this, and Fred Hoyle didn't get the Nobel Prize for it, and he was pretty pissed off about that. Um, um, but, you know, he, he was a guy who didn't make enough friends to probably suggest he should get it, you know. So there's a, a lesson to be learned. If you want to get awards, you ought to have a few friends to nominate you. Anyway, so that was the situation. Okay, so um, 
And by the way, he went on to really irritate a lot of other people, like all the people in biology. And also he irritated me because he called me a liar on television, so I didn't take very kindly to that. But there you go. So he, he, was a, he, was a, he got a bit past this in his old age. Okay, so we got these comets. Now, that, the comets are really rather interesting. As they come towards the, the sun, um, the trajectory is roughly like this, and stuff comes off it. The uncharged particles remain along the trajectory, but the solar wind from the sun, okay, can blow and couple with the ions and the um, negative and positively charged species and blow that uh, plasma tail out. And that's why you see often more than one tail. And as it comes towards the sun, you blow the plasma tail off because it couples so strongly with the the particles that come off the sun. The other thing to realize, this is a photograph, a fantastic photograph of Halley's Comet. As the, as the comet comes towards the sun, it's the, it's the face towards the sun that warms up and evaporates. So the material that's coming off the comet is not coming off the back, as it would in a jet engine or something like that. It's coming off the front and is being blown back by the solar wind. Um, and so we have this sort of image. Halley's Comet in 1948 was uh, right at the, uh, outside the solar system almost. In 1979 it was near uh, the orbit of Pluto. In 1983 Uranus, 1985 Saturn, and in 1986 those of us who saw it probably, well, saw it, how about that? Yeah, it was probably in 1986. All right. Um, it's kind of going to be back in 2061. I'm not sure I'm going to make it, but there you go. It reminds me of George Burns. He came to England and, and he went to the London Palladium. And it turned out that he, when he was 96, and the Palladium was 96 as well, and it's an old building. And George Burns, how many of you know George Burns? You know, he was smoking his cigar and he said, they'll be back, he'll be back when we're both 100. I don't know whether this place is going to make it. So I don't know whether I'm going to make it, but I'm going to have a bloody good try. All right, so this is the situation. We've got a comet. We've got a plasma coming off one end, and we've got neutral species. The dust is neutral, and the iron tail is ionized, okay? And this beautiful spectrum here, which was the first detection of H2O in the comet, it was H2O+, and we see that the H2O+, plus is in the top half of the spectrum here, and in the bottom half, as you align the slit across the comet, you see NH2, which is isoelectronic with H2O+. They have a rather similar spectrum, uh, is in the bottom half. And I think this is one of the most brilliant pictures I've ever seen. For our interest, it, what about carbon? The, the comet spectrum is down below. And if you look here, that set of bands is actually C3, the C3 molecule which is really a rather interesting molecule. Uh, it's more stable and is more easily observed than C2. And it was first detected in a comet. In fact, the bands, this bands were, uh, first of all, it was about 1880, I understand, but were finally assigned around the 1950s by Alec Douglas, who was a, a good friend of mine um, at National Research Council, a brilliant spectroscopist, by isotopic substitution. He was able to find this band and produce it in the laboratory from a, a methane plasma and find that carbon atom, putting uh, carbon-13 in there, he was able to show that it was the C3 molecule. And here are some spectra of the C3 molecule in uh, spectrum comet 1941. Okay, so comets have got carbon in them as well. Now, that was around the 1950s. In 1933, Carl Jansky working at the Bell Telephone Laboratories, built this aerial. And um, it, this is a picture of him looking superly, suitably like a general. Um, and he was the first person to detect radio signal from outside the Earth, OK? Now, Bell Labs, Bell Telephone, as you probably knew, knew or know, used to be interested in communications, right, <laughs> before the, not sure what they're interested in now, but nevertheless, they used to be. And that's what they were interested in, to find out what was going on, where the radio signals were coming from. And in this particular image, we see that as it rotated, the uh, peak in the radio signal went up as it pointed along the galactic plane. So that was, and it shifted with galactic time, and so it was clearly coming from 
outside the galaxy. The next breakthrough was by this gentleman, Grote Reber. Uh, Grote Reber. I've got to defer to my colleague, Bob Fulton, in, in there. Is that, how, is that okay? Okay. okay. This is not too bad, anyway. Um, and he built this telescope, which is the forerunner of the satellite dishes. And this is the first radio telescope of that kind. And for those of you who are interested in amateur whatever, um, this, he was an amateur astronomer, and it's not a trivial sight because I suppose that that little house on the side is, is either um, a, a house or a room, at least, or maybe the loo. Anyway, the story goes that his mother was really pissed off with him because it would fill the whole garden and she had nowhere to hang out the washing, so that was the situation. Now, that was about 1940s. After the war, um, a very interesting uh, suggestion was made, I think by a Dutch astronomer, is that you should be able to detect hydrogen by the spin-flip transition. Because the spin of the, whoops, um, of the electron and the proton can be either parallel or anti-parallel, that transition occurs at 21 centimeters. And that was detected, and here is the historical detection in 1951 by Ewan and Purcell of hydrogen atoms in the galaxy. This was a massive breakthrough, because up till then, the only thing you could see were stars. And now you could look at this radio signal and check its Doppler shift. And as you looked around the galaxy, you could see that these clouds of hydrogen were shifting and there were multiple. And this was then uh, allowed us to actually map out our own galaxy. We can't actually see our own galaxy because, you know, uh, we're sitting in the galactic plane. It's all dust and debris. And so we can only see about 6,000 light years. And the center of the galaxy is about 30,000 light years away. I mean, you know this thing, you look, you're here in, in uh, Tallahassee and you can see stars are millions of miles away and you can't even see the car ahead of you. It's that sort of situation. So we can see out of the galaxy this way, but we can't actually see along the galaxy. And you can break down these into vectors, which are shown here, and show that our galaxy is very similar to this beautiful spiral galaxy. Now, the resolution of a telescope is dependent on the diameter and the frequency and the wavelength. And the radio frequency is very low compared to an optical telescope, okay? Radio signals, if you look at it. So basically, radio telescopes have very low resolution. I mean, these telescopes, although they're very big, that one there has a poorer resolution than Galileo's little first telescope that he had because of the, he was looking in the visible range, and these were in the radio range. And a big breakthrough was made by Martin Ryle at Cambridge, what was called the One Mile Telescope, which is a set of dishes. Uh, okay, you can see them there marching along one mile away, and was, was called aperture synthesis, where basically the diameter of, you, you correlated the signals from all these telescopes, and so you got a resolution which was actually dependent on how far the two end telescopes were from each other. And now you can do this. Uh, with a telescope on one side of the Earth or another one on the other side of the Earth. And so you can get a res resolution which is dependent on the diameter uh, of the Earth itself and, in fact, satellites as well. There are very large arrays here. That's another one. Um, but this is an interesting one because a friend of mine was the guy who built it. And we spent about 12 days on the telescope. And it was the one, uh, basically a, an aerial built in a field and he was one of the guys winding all these things. And the, the lucky student to be on the telescope after all the hard work was done was Jocelyn Bell. And she was a very good student. And she found that there was a signal coming in uh, from outer space. And here's Jocelyn uh, next to the telescope. And that was the detection of the pulsar. It was a signal that was, was, uh, had a certain frequency, which I don't remember because I don't have the memory for numbers that the gentleman in the lo at the end has uh, for, for the numbers of pi. But uh, essentially every time it, this beam of radiation passed through the Earth, you could hear that signal. And so that telescope again detected the pulsar. The next radio telescope of some fame was this thing, which looks like an ancient horn that you know you stick in your ear. And that's basically what it was. And this was built by Penzias and Wilson at Bell Labs again. And when they switched it on, they found the noise level was 
much higher than they expected. Um, they were electronics engineers, and they wanted a very low noise signal, but there was this hiss coming out of this thing. And uh, they would decide to take it apart. And they found that there were some pigeons that crapped on the detector, and, you know, all over the thing. There was all this white stuff, which was very difficult to get off. And they evicted the pigeon, and the, apparently the pigeon kept coming back, so they shot it. Okay, I was, I was somewhat, you know, it was a sacrifice in, for science, really. But anyway, it turned out the signal was a three-degree background. And they didn't know this, but um, Dickey in Princeton, only 30 miles away, was scooped because he was building a detector to try to see the remnants of the Big Bang which had been predicted to be up something like 10, up to 10 degrees Kelvin, and they found that it was 3 degrees K. And now, some of you may know that this is the black body radiation uh, left over from the Big Bang, and is the strongest evidence we have that there was a, a Big Bang 13.7 billion years ago. And the Kobe satellite has shown this, and this is the, the, the universe, and according to this, it's basically... Um, fluctuations by less than, or sort of, uh, basically no fluctuation greater, I should, it should be the other way around, greater than 10 to the minus, 20 times 10 to the minus 6. So it's pretty close to black body radiation. The next radio detection was the detection of ammonia in Orion. And this was a massive breakthrough um, of the last sort of 40 years. This was by Charles Towns, who uh, developed the maser and then led on to the laser, but he was also fascinated in astronomy, and he was the person who detected Orion. And this is a map of ammonia in Orion. And let's have a look at Orion. As uh, many of you will recognize, probably the most easily recognized um, constellation. Here is a map on the left-hand side, and if I take that star, that in the top one is the middle star in the belt of Orion, and the one on the bottom left is there, we can get a feel for the fact that that blue cloud down the bottom is about 100 light years long and is full of molecules. That blue cl cloud is about 10 to the 6, about a million solar masses of molecules. So although you can see the stars, the heaviest, most of the stuff is uh, in that picture is mo molecular and this was a big excitement because we, we discovered that the biggest, heaviest objects in the universe were actually giant molecular clouds. Here are the three stars in the belt of Orion, and it, some of you might be able to see that, in fact, here is, in there, is the Horsehead Nebula. So if you want to know where the Horsehead, the famous Horsehead, is there. And here is the Orion Nebula, which in oxygen emission looks like this, and it's very rare to find a photograph which shows you the f four or five stars, that was called in the trapezium, the brightest stars, the four bright stars, which are actually photodissociating this. So the UV irradiation from those four stars in the center are actually photodissociating the cloud around it. And here is an infrared image of stars just turned on deeper behind the cloud, and maybe in a thousand years there'll be many more stars in there, because this, this is the place where stars are born. Okay, so there's basically, just in case I put you to sleep, um, exploding stars. Well, we've talked a little bit about them, and um, these stars are basically where hydrogen is squeezed to helium, helium to carbon, carbon to helium and oxygen. Millions of years ago, a star blew up. I didn't know I had so many blew your atoms out into space, they floated around for millions of years, and you ended up on the Earth. And I often tell young kids, you know, do you want to see an alien? And they say, yeah, I'd love to see an alien. Well, I just tell them to look in this mirror, because basically we all came from outer space. All right. Now, where does my part of this whole thing come in? Well, it came, well, to some extent when I was an undergraduate student working, and I was trying to get the spectrum of C302 with carbon chains. But the big breakthrough for me was to make a, my close friend, David Walton, at the University of Sussex, um, who was a real expert at screening carbon atoms together. This is one of his molecules, and this was a crystal structure. So by putting large uh, silyl, uh, trimethyl silyl groups on, you could stabilize that. Don't try to do this without putting those on, by the way. 
because it's dangerous. Okay. But Dave actually made um, a molecule with 32 carbon atoms, and I was just so impressed by this. And we got together with a, a young undergraduate uh, called Alexander, and we made a, um, a very s short chain, HC5N. Um, basically, you have a sort of cup, uh, oxidative coupling, and you can stick them together. And Dave was a very a real expert at sticking these together and then cleaving off one end and making these molecules. And Anthony made the HC5N molecule around 1974, a long time ago, probably, well, mo before most of you in the audience were born, and unfortunately, in some cases, before your mother was born as well. But anyway, okay, but in radio astronomy, um, w rotations of a dipole will give rise to a photon, which you can de detect by radio astronomy very accurately. The next piece of good fortune was that my friend Takeshi Oka, um, we'd been postdocs. I mean, this guy is just brilliant. Um, I mean, in fact, he was, he was the best experimentalist stroke theoretician combining these two I've ever met. And I thought that, well, you know, if you have to be as good as this guy, I think I'm going to go and do something else. Um, but anyway, um, I said we got the frequency of HC5N from the microwave, and he said, sent this letter back to me, uh, basically, uh, much interested. There are as many varies as there are carbon atoms in this molecule, right? And we got together and we detected that molecule in interstellar space, and that was really very exciting. So let's see w w what was happening. This is a picture of the Algonquin telescope in uh, Canada, and to give you an idea, you can walk in through this, so it's a pretty big object, and the receiver was in there. And um, we were able to detect HC5N in not only um, Sagittarius, our first object, but also in a, a, a cloud in Taurus called Taurus Molecular Cloud 1. Okay. And we went on to detect one with seven carbon atoms and one with nine carbon atoms. And my favorite image is this one. And this image was on the day of my, the most exciting day I ever had as a scientist when we detected that molecule. You, you might think it was C60 or some other thing, but it turned out, and I don't have time to talk about it, but it was just the most exhilarating moment of my life as a scientist. And we were so proud, it went in the newspapers, we had our photograph taken, it went into the newspapers. And when it got to England, the chemicals were discovered thanks to Canadian work in radio astrology. Uh, okay. There you go. Uh, not only English newspapers. I'm told there are at least 10 times as many astrologers as there are astronomers in the USA. Anyway, that was very exciting because we detected the longest, heaviest, and you know, biggest molecules that have been seen. And now, after several years, there are several hundred molecules. And ours are really still the biggest. HC11N was detected by some other people, but HC7, and it led to the detection of carbon chains. And that's the first step in the story. Now, when these were detected, I couldn't understand why they were there. And we see here a graph that HC7N is more than an order of magnitude bigger than anything else in this region, HC9N. For some reason, the carbon chains were much more abundant than expected. Now, how could that be? Well, I was thinking about this, and there was an amazing paper from the 1960s by Hintenberger and colleagues, 1963. And I'll show you it because it's a mass spectrum of a discharge between carbon rods. And here we see C3 to C33. Okay. Now, People have conjectured what these carbon species with structures might be. And I always thought, well, they'd be linear mainly. But some people thought they might be monocyclic rings. And if they're monocyclic rings, then the Huckel 4n plus 2 rule should apply. And so carbon rings with 6, 10, 14, 8 electrons might show stability or aromatic character, whatever that is. But as you're looking in the mass spectrum, Maybe C11 plus 15, 19, and 23 might be expected to be strong. And if you look, they actually are. And if you look at the ones in between, they're definitely low. 
So this one from the 60s, and it was thought to be really good evidence that these were monocyclic rings. <coughs> so that's the paper that was in my mind for 10 years, a fascinating possibility. Another result came, and I'm showing you the original detection of a red giant IRC 10216, the number's not correct, correct there, by Eric Becklin. Ten times larger than any star that, of its kind. It was a, a 10 micron infrared detection. And Eric was a young astronomer, and he went running down the corridor because he realized that this was a massively interesting object. It was the strongest infrared emitter. The, these are the very early days of infrared astronomy because infrared lagged way behind radio astronomy with infrared detection. And it turned out, basically, that it's a red giant, an old carbon-rich red giant. The central core is about 300 to 700 kel Kelvin, and its the diameter is about 10 to the minus 5 light years, about the size of the, of the Earth's orbit. The outer atmosphere is much cooler, it's about one light year. And in this star, the polyines were detected, and a whole load of molecules were, were detected in that star. And here is a picture of it, blowing out carbon dust all over the place, massively important. And the sort of star in which your carbon atoms were synthesized. Okay, so there we have it. We have a discharge in carbon. We have this star blowing out, and then the polyines were detected in this star. So I was really interested in these stars. And in fact, just to give you an idea of what you see, you see this sort of Batman-shaped, you know, sort of, contour. Why is that? Because as the gas is blown off in all directions, as you look at these massive stars with a radio telescope, you see material coming towards you or relatively towards you and away from you, and you get a Doppler shifted line. So when you see a line like that, you know that you've got a red giant star and Batman is around. Okay, so that's the why you get Batman aired spectra. And this star really fascinated me. Okay, Another part of the story, which is very important, is that Don Huffman, in Nature, published this work, that there's a band, a big feature, called the UV hump at 2170 angstroms. Here's the interstellar spectrum, okay? And then if we go, here is the experimental smoke spectrum, okay? And the calculated me scattering. And he published this paper saying this bump is probably produced by carbon particles. Okay, that's 1973. Okay. The other thing that's lying some fantastic puzzles is what's called the diffuse interstellar bands. And these are a load of bands, and here are some of them. Let me try and blow them up so you can see. They, they are well identified. Their frequencies are well known. There are 500 of these in absorption, and not a single one has been assigned. And yet we've got loads of molecules, we've got mo loads of spectra, and not a single one of these diffuse bands has been assigned. And yet it's all over the galaxy. Whichever star you're looking almost towards any material that's reddened, any place where there's a bit of dust, you see these bands. And they look like molecular bands. So what is this molecule? So here we have star blowing out carbon chains, a discharge by Hintenberger, got up to C33, and here, again, is another of these bands, okay, and the diffuse bands. So, as luck would have it, in 1984 at Easter, Bob Curl invited me to go to Rice University, and I met Rick Smalley. And here is Rick on top of his apparatus. He's an extremely ebullient character, and he, he just created this amazing machine for laser vaporization of metals, silicon, and other things. And the heart of it is a, is a magnetic pulse valve, which is shown here. So this is the bit. And there's a hole here through which you fire a laser, focus laser through that hole. Okay, so what do you do? You fire a laser at the same time as helium passes along this tube. This tube is about one to two millimeters diameter. I'll just do it again, okay? And, and synchronize the laser with the helium pulse. And what you'll get is a plasma blowing across the... the the, the chamber, and the idea, as I was watching this, well, if we vaporize carbon in this 
apparatus. Maybe we'll produce the plasma coming off a carbon star. So that was the basic idea. Well, you do this lots of times, and you sort of integrate for a long period of time, and you observe the mass spectra of um, whatever is coming out of that. And I thought, well, maybe we'll see the carbon chains coming out of it. And I suggested that to Bob and Rick, and a, that was Easter in 1984. Um, around June of 84, this paper was published by exactly this same thing. I, I suggested this experiment, but the Exxon group published this, and you'll notice this is a, an interesting number there. I wonder what it is. Okay. Now, that paper was in the literature for a year, sitting there. I saw it. I was really particularly interested in this lot, but this paper was there for around 1984. Not only that, at Bell Labs somewhat later, they got, did the same thing, and they picked off by time of flight. See, this is the strongest picture here, 50 and 60 is strong, and they photo decomposed it. The curious thing is that neither they, and particularly the Bell Lab people, didn't ask themselves what bloody thing might be. Okay. Well, some of you might know, I'll just quickly rehash a little bit of it, that it, the, the experiments in 1985, September 1985. Now, how many of you saw the Google Doodle last week? Okay. Well, it looks as though everybody in the world except the people in this room. Anyway, to cut a long story short, about a year and a half ago, I met um, Laurie Park from Google and suggested that they should celebrate the 25th anniversary of the discovery of C60, which was la a week last Saturday, okay, on the 4th of September. Anyway, Jim Heath and Sean O'Brien and Yu Ang Liu were the students involved in this. And this is the signal that we got. And notice that it's a lot bigger because we've changed the conditions. Depending on the conditions, you could get a very strong signal. And I wrote C60 plus question mark, C60 huge, and C70 also. And basically, the idea, as you well know, that we discussed what it might be, basically, um, how did hexagons... I mean, this is the floor of Bob Curl's <laughs> loo. And I, I, during this period, I would sit and contemplate this floor, what was so special about it. We thought that Mr. Fuller's doll might be interesting. And I'd made this for my children with pentagons on it. And I told Rick, I think this, you know, this structure I have at home, which... <clears throat> might have 60 vertices, has pentagons as well. And the next morning he came in with this, and it has 60 vertices. And we were just ecstatic. That, uh, and we never thought that, you know, is it right or wrong? It just was so incredible that it was not only that and the soccer ball as well, uh, that we had our photograph taken with Bob in the middle as captain of the team. And that was the story of C60. I won't talk about the red solution. It's too painful. Okay. Now... Let's go to carbon itself, because we were able to do some other experiments other than C60. And with reaction with hydrogen, you were able to show that the major peak on the even species that came up was with two hydrogens. So that's C14H2. Okay. And we were able to get here the microwave spectrum of HC7N done at Sussex the detection of HC7N in Algonquin in Canada, and the detection of HC7N mass spectrum by laser vaporization at RICE in the USA. So I'm quite fond about the, of this particular um, triple picture. Not only that, there are giant fullerenes. Um, you, if you vaporize carbon, you can see structures up to at least 1,000 carbon atoms. Okay. Carbon vapor is like no other vapor. Um, you can't vaporize uh, graphite or get it even to be liquid until three or th between three and 4,000 degrees. And people have tried to look at liquid carbon and blown, I think two labs have blown their labs up because by the time it becomes liquid, it's extremely reactive and reactive with whatever you put it in. And there's nothing to put it in, right? You know, when they're three, 4,000 degrees. Um, but it looks as though there are giant full reasons. They don't want to go on that because I talked about it before, but there are other things. And there are nanotubes, okay, and multi-wall nanotubes. Okay, so that's what the situation was until I came to Florida State and met my new co-workers here. Um, um, I don't know whether this is known. Aren't they playing Wake Forest next week? 
Two weeks, okay. The, the last game I was allowed to go to, they lost 0-28. And as my son said about one football team, they were lucky to get nil. But anyway, there you go. Uh, all right, we, we, so much for that one. Um, and of course, uh, obviously, many of you know a um, great bunch of, of colleagues here. Um, now, unfortunately, this guy doesn't really do pull his weight very much anymore. I don't know. I, I'm trying to get him to come in and stop him from being sunburned. But there you go. Anyway, um, so some very interesting things. Let's see the, see the time. Okay, I'm going to jump on because I've got a lot to, to look at. Um, one thing um, that I predicted around 1986-87 was that Fullerenes might behave as super atoms with their own sort of valency. And um, one that uh, really interested me was basically C28 because I was playing around like this little girl is playing around, making a model. And the molecule I wanted to make was C32 because Rick had got some results which indicated that as you photofragmented C60 down to 50, you could knock out two at a time, 58, 56. You went down to C32 and at C32 it blew apart. So I was interested in the structure of C32. So I was trying to make it, but I made C28 first. And my hair stood on end because I knew we had a very strong signal for C28 under certain conditions. And that got me interested in this structure. And I realized it should be tetravalent in that it should be able to add four hydrogens and be stabilized by four hydrogens. Okay, so that was the situation. And for some reason, I think we go out of, you know, yes, okay, let's get out of that one and go on because that was still on the thing, and we go now to this, um, and go to the results that Paul's dunk has just been getting um, at the Magnet Lab. Now, what Paul has done is um, taken um, the sort of same system that Smalley had developed, okay, where you have a laser vaporization, you fire a laser, Okay, the laser fires in there, you get a plasma off it, and you skim it to VNR. Just in case you missed that, I'll do it again. You fire the laser, plasma comes out, and it goes into the next chamber. Okay, so that's at one side. Then you have an accumulation octopole, okay, so it builds up the molecules. A stage of pumping, and then a transfer octopole, which will take you into the ICR, all right? So that's the system that Paul has set up with Alan Marshall at the Maglet Lab. And the main isotope of titanium that we're, we're vaporizing is, has a mass of 48. Now, some of you m may have realized that 48 is 4 times 12. And so if carbon's in there, there may be an, an approximate overlap. And there is. But with Alan's fantastic resolution, you can look at this. And here you have all these mass spectra. So this is C titanium C28 with C32 there. And if we actually look at it, we can actually take away the 32 and you can quite easily resolve it. And so we're detecting molecules, these endohedral species. Now, these have been done before, but they've been focusing on the larger species. We're looking at the small ones, smaller than 60, and looking at stabilization of these, okay? So basically, you look at this, we find that titanium C28 is actually very strong. Titanium C44 is stronger, but the interesting thing is that under the conditions that we see C28, we see no pure uh, C28. C44 is very strong here, and so it's not surprising that it, we might be able to see the titanium. So it, we've got some circumstantial evidence that titanium is stabilizing C28, and there's a possibility that we could hopefully one day extract it. That's, that's one of the sort of things we're hoping to do in the future. So this is titanium inside C28. Well, I was asked to produce a one-page summary of what we were doing. Okay. Well, we're looking at self-assembly and with Prashant, uh, Naresh, Ron Clark, and Tony Cheatham in Cambridge, we've done some very interesting work. In this case uh, here, we've got these nickel clusters which are two-dimensional 
and also these, this multiferroic system, which in fact this nitrogen atom can jump around. Um, just to show that I can put, I can put as much on, most, on the sheet as most people in the universe. So you can't read it. <laughs> there you go. Um, this is the titanium uh, results that I've just been talking about. And uh, Daryl and our trees have been looking at carbon nanotubes, making mats of these like carbon paper and honeycomb structures. This, is, this one with the B is actually a honeycomb. This one without the B is actually a nanoscale honeycomb. All right. Now, I'm going to finish with a few observations. C60 seems to be everywhere. It's unbelievable that it waited till 1985 to find it, okay? Well, let's look. This is the mass spectrum of a sooting flame. It is almost incredible to believe that no combustion lab anywhere put a mass spectrometer on a sooting flame over uh, 400 mass units. You've all made C60. Every time you light a Bunsen burner and you turn it to yellow, you're making C60 in about 10% yield compared to the soot. This is a picture by Howard. And here you see C60 this is way off scale. And it's damn so easier to do this than build the laser vaporization system. It's incredible. This could have been done 1950s when the first mass spectrometer was even probably earlier than that. And it's interesting to look back at this image and this book. It's called Michael Faraday during Christmas 1860 presented his final series of lectures to young people at the Royal Institution. These lectures are to be found in a book, The Chemical History of a Candle, wherein are described all aspects of combustion. Well, not all. In particular, Faraday drew attention to the case of imperfect combustion. He also stated it is to the presence of solid particles in the candle flame that it owes its brilliance. Thus, the sooting flame is yellow. When the sooting flame is yellow, you're producing C60, and it's pretty stable in about 10% yield. But as it goes through the flame barrier into the oxygen, you lose it because it's a molecule. It's lost just like that. So that's the reason why it was not seen. All right? So in a flame combustion, it's extremely difficult, and it never really accumulated, which is what you've got to do to detect it. So that's the situation. It's in combustion flames. You've all made it. Um, it came from left field. It's interesting that we're still, after many, many decades, fighting for fundamental research um, in the sense that, by and large, at least 50, maybe more of the major breakthroughs were made by people who didn't know what they were doing, right? Well, they knew what they were doing, but they were doing something else that they didn't know they were doing, right? And uh, I've been fighting this battle, and I'm sure many of my colleagues have been fighting this battle to point out that, first of all, arguably the most important experiments are those where you discover that you are wrong, okay? Because you learn something. Hopefully, you discover something else. And in the case of the discovery of C60, I would point out that it was not a very exciting experiment for my colleagues. It was a bit more interesting for me because I wanted to show that carbon chains came out of the star. And my friend Bill Klemper said, Harry, he said, don't worry about it. We can make it by iron molecule reaction. So I just wanted to stick the polyine up Bill's nose, really. You know, that was the main reason. And, um, and I knew what the result was. I was absolutely convinced. And the results were exactly what I expected, plus C60, which I didn't expect. And that's an, uh, another take-home message. Even if you were absolutely sure you know what the result is, you must do the experiment. A, if it doesn't work, you discover you were wrong. You learn something. B, there might be something unexpected, which is nice and surprising, as in this case. And in fact, I remember Bob rang me up and said, uh, you know, we're going to do this experiment, Harry. Are you coming or shall we send you the results? And here's another thing. Go and do the experiment yourself, because I'm, I'm pretty sure that um, I would not have been involved in this program. Um, and I wouldn't be here, which is probably a good thing. You never know. Uh, but there you go. Anyway, there's a whole load of fullerene chemistry. 
Uh, that's how we do it. Time, yes, well, let's forget that. But let's look at this. This is an interesting graph which I got. Um, they now are averaging about 1,000 papers a year on fullerenes, okay? The nanotubes are rocking up, up to about seven or 8,000 a year. And graphene, which many of you will have heard of, is really rocketing up at 2008. Um, so the, the discovery of C60 has led to certainly the chemistry of the fullerenes and a lot of, a lot of work. Um, and, of course, it also led to the rediscovery of the, of the nanotubes. Okay, so I'm near the end. Um, this is my favorite po publication, and it's in Japanese. Um, it's a book coming out of, of these little boys' dog, and every time he sees a painting, he gets ten times smaller, and the dog does too. Okay, so this is coming out at Christmas. Is it, if if you can read Japanese, uh, there. Anyway, uh, there you go. It's all about this, and it's all about this. And it, in the end, the little boy is saved by C60 because he gets inside the body, of um, and floats around with his dog. Okay, so that's my favorite publication on C60. Right, we're near the end, but about six or seven weeks ago, really something interesting happened. And I'm looking at a piece of film from a program which was a Horizon, BBC Horizon program, which was made around 91, 92, about C60. And I was in it, and Jim, uh, Heath was in it, and uh, Rick was in it, and Wolfgang Kretschmer, a really delightful guy, um, and he and Huffman extracted C60. But I'm going to extract a bit from the film. <laughs> I believe it is there, and it would be rather nice to feel that, in fact, we were on the right track. There are some interesting features in space, and C60 certainly can fit them better than any other proposal that has been made up to now. I'm a believer, and I think ultimately we'll find that it is there. But others have said that uh, C60 is nothing like a match for the diffusion program. They're wrong. Okay, so that's a bit of film. And it turns out that C60 has just been detected in space about seven weeks ago. And it's an amazing detection, and we should have known it was in a red giant star. And here is the, d the data. And we see here um, the, the white is the total emission. And the red is C60, infrared data. And f the f four features are there. And not only that, C70 is there. Here is the C70. And there's almost nothing else there. In the infrared of this star, the only strong features which you can recognize are C60 and C70 which is staggering. My juror sent me an email a few days ago. He said he's been, they've been looking at other things. He says, it looks like 1% of the carbon in the interstellar medium is in, the surf, is, is in C60. It has been all over the place. It's been sort of under our noses all the time. And it's the third form of carbon. And I've always thought, and for some of you, um, this might be an interesting piece of film.
I'm going to stop it there. And so, with that, still one little problem to solve, to find the third man and to show that the diffuse interstellar bands probably involve C60. That was an interesting thing. So there's still a, an interesting puzzle uh, still lurking out there. Thanks a lot.